Okay, good evening. Welcome. It's uh, continuing now with our story of the second soul, second chapter of Tanya. And the second chapter of Tanya takes us into the second soul. So that's what we're going to be talking about this evening, the second soul. And um, really what we've started to discover is that the second soul is related to the idea of being a, a, a breath of Hashem as opposed to a word of Hashem. So the whole of creation is words of Hashem. Hashem said this and Hashem said that, so on and so forth. That's how creation happened. But when it comes to the neshama, the neshama is not a, a word of creation. The neshama is the breath of God Himself. And the implication is that when you breathe, it's something deep within you that you share with whoever it is that you're breathing into. So think of resuscitation. It's a very dramatic way to picture it, but it definitely helps us to get the idea. That was the beginning of this chapter. We said that the nefesh erikis, this godly soul of ours, is chelek eloika mimal mamesh. It's literally a piece of God from on high. And now we want to understand what that means. Because to use the metaphor of Hashem breathing or blowing the soul into us, as powerful as it is, is far from the full picture. Really, there's a, a lot more that we have to understand about this notion of being a piece of God. And so last week we began the following concept, which we'll develop further this week, and please God, in the next one or two shiurim still to come. So what did we learn? We learned this principle that Yisrael olu b'machshava, that the, the, the reality of being a Jewish soul, it's not just that Hashem, so to speak, blew the soul into us, which is unique, but it's olu b'machshav. It's a very unique kind of expression that our sages use. And it means that something rose, so to speak, in God's mind. And effectively what that is supposed to represent is when you have an idea that is the precipitator for a whole series of things that are going to happen, for a whole process, so we call that precipitator olu b'machshav. That's what started me off in the first place. That's what got the ball rolling. And as we say in the Friday night davening, we say, Soif maise b'machshava t'chila. That there's this motivating factor that starts an entire process. And the minute you have such a motivating factor, that tells you and implies that it's obviously something which is very important and the purpose of everything. So the moment we say that olu b'machshava, that our neshamas, began in Hashem's mind, effectively what we're saying is that we're the purpose. This is the purpose for which we were, not just we were created, but everything was created. And we began last week to explain a very important principle that will help us to understand this. Machshava. When you speak about thought as a human being, human thought is one thing. Divine thought, something completely different, as we'll see in this evening's piece we'll see that the way that Hashem's so-called intellect operates is so radically different from intellect that we are familiar with that we can use the expression and say, what you and I call thought is certainly not thought in God's terms. Now, the reason we're talking about this is because we say that that's our point of origin. We, as Jewish souls, the divine soul, the nefesh elikis, what's unique about us is that we originate in God's Intellect. Now, we need to understand what that is. You know, when you spoke about breathing, it was a nice, beautiful metaphor. It was a little bit poetic. But the minute you start to talk about intellect, that's a whole different story. And especially when you talk about divine intellect. So we began last week to unpack it. And this week, please God, we'll get a little bit more insight. So we're going to dive straight in. And we're going to see the language that the Alter Rebbe uses uh, to describe this unique way that Hashem's mind, so to speak, operates. So he says, The this notion, the idea of how God's intellect works, it is something that the human mind cannot fully grasp. So what can the human mind not fully grasp? Last week we saw that the Rambam, Maimonides, has a view where he explains the nature of God's intellect. And he uses this expression, Hu ha yodea, v'hu ha mado, v'hu ha yodua. That what is absolutely distinct about God's way of operating intellect is that who ha yoidea, he is the one who knows. Who ha mada, he is the means by which you know, the intellectual software by which you know. Who ha yodua, and he is that which is known. 
And the Rambam then goes on to say, it's not menu. It's not an external process of knowledge, unlike human beings. So in other words, what's he trying to tell us? In the human experience, in the human experience, there's me. I am me. I have a name. I have an identity. I have a particular role that I play in life. I have a particular position in the family. There are a whole lot of things that define me. And some of the time, I use intellect, right? We're not going to get into the details of how much of the time. <laughs> Maybe that's a little bit of an indictment on human beings. We've been endowed with this incredible intellect that Hashem gave us. How often do we actually get to use it? Uh, I think it was Einstein who said that there are two things that are beyond measure. You know, that nobody, that, 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 uh, there's, nobody knows how far they could go. And one of them is the limits of human, human stupidity. Right? That there's, there's, there's no limit to human stupidity. So here we are, we've been given this incredible intellect. We don't necessarily use it. Why? Because I am not my intellect. It is the greatest asset that Hashem has given me. It's the most incredible thing. It's what, disti it's what distinguishes me from all other living creatures. The fact that I have an intellect, but does not mean that I'm going to use it. So in the human experience, effectively what we're going to see is that in the human experience, the person and the intellect are fundamentally separate from each other. They, they, you know, it's not a guarantee that just because a person has intellect that they will necessarily use that intellect. Not only that, but when a person does use their intellect, it is like an add-on. It's a particular feature, right? Now I'm using the feature called intellect. It's kind of like your cell phone, right? Your cell phone has a whole lot of apps. There's no guarantee that you'll be using any of those apps just because you have them. And when you use a particular app, you could say that this is a third-party app. It doesn't necessarily belong to the makers of this particular cell phone, right? It's a third-party app that I happen to be using at this particular point in time. And by the same token, a human being could use the app called Intellect, or they could use a different app at a different time. <laughs> it could be the, act, the, the app called uh, Stupidity, or the app called Immaturity, or whatever the case is. So for us as people, the Yodea, the Yodua, and the Mada are not necessarily all... Uh, to, you know, all related to each other certainly not all one with each other they can be divorced and therefore when we know things if you think about it when we learn things and when we know things it's kind of like fishing so i'm here in my world on dry land there's this mega ocean of information out there and i cast my mind out find a piece of information that bites and i reel it in to try and understand it in my own mind. So in exactly the same way as the person, you know, you can, again, you can be poetic. You can, you can say, here's a person, the whole way he moves with his fishing rod, it is as if the man and rod have become one. Okay, it's beautiful and it's poetic for those people who write poetry about fishermen. But at the end of the day, obviously, everybody will acknowledge that the, the person and the uh, fishing rod are certainly not one in the same. I mean, that would be a little bit ridiculous, right? At the end of the day, you pack away your fishing rod and you go home. And it's exactly the same thing. You can sit and spend a period of time involved in academic pursuit. At the end of the day, you pack your brain away and you say, I need some down, downtime. I just want to vegetate in front of the TV or, or whatever it is that people do at the end of, um, of intellectual exertion. Because I am not intellect. I can survive without my intellect. And when I do learn, it's out there. It's an external probing kind of an experience where I go exploring the great encyclopedic knowledge of what the world has to offer. And then I come back to my safe space with the bounty that I've gathered. So that's why it is that in the human experience, very often there's a breakdown between what a person has learned and how they live can get quite frustrating sometimes you say but i don't understand it you're such an intelligent person and you understand this information so much so that you could even be a lecturer about this information and yet you don't live that information and the answer is well that's exactly how it is because i am not my knowledge knowledge is what i possess and then i choose out of that knowledge what will i apply what will i choose not to apply it's a fascinating thought so you'll get a person who might lecture on health and how important it is to exercise and to protect yourself and not to smoke and not to drink. And then that same person may actually be a liver sedentary lifestyle and they might actually uh, overdose on who knows what. Why? Because there's a breakdown between the knowledge and the knower. Because for us, in our experience, knowledge is external. Now with God, 
there's an absolute difference between Hashem's experience of knowledge and knowing and ours. Because Hashem's not going fishing in the world of knowledge to try and extract information that He could know. God is everything. So the knowledge that Hashem has is Him. Now this is particularly relevant to our conversation because the moment we say that our souls begin in Hashem's knowledge, in Hashem's thought, we're actually making a statement that the point of origin of our souls is within God Himself, not what God has made, not what God has shared, not what God has radiated, but what God is. And that principle that the Rambam tells us, that notion of how God's intellect works is something impossible for us to understand fully. Why is it impossible for us to understand fully? For exactly the same reason that all alien movies really just have uh, strange versions of humans and animals. Right? There's not, I, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not so much into the sci-fi world, but I would assume that we haven't yet come up with an alien movie where the alien creature comes down into this world and does not have eyes or ears or hands. <laughs> we can't do that because you can only perceive things that are familiar in your reality. And then you could take the things that you perceive and you could distort them and you could create some kind of a mutant and say, that's an alien. So that's why aliens have three eyes or they're green or they have antennae coming out of their heads because we take other experiences that we're familiar with and we warp them and say, that's what an alien is. A person is not capable of understanding something that isn't in their frame of reference at all. Now, seeing as the idea of knowing something intrinsically because you are the information that you're knowing is foreign to us. That's not how we're designed. So therefore, we can't understand this concept. We can pay it lip service. We can say it exists. We can understand it in the most superficial, abstract way, but we cannot lahavinoi al buryoi. We can't understand the principle clearly because it's foreign to us. And he can prove that to us. Kidrsiv, as the Pasuk says, the verses tell us that um, first of all, Hakeker Eloika Timsa, rhetorical question. Hakeker Eloika Timsa. Is it possible that you will be able to probe God? In other words, that you'll be able to come to any level of appreciation, intellectual appreciation of God? Rhetorical question. No, you can't. Ochsiv, and as the famous Pasuk says from Yeshaya, from the prophet Isaiah, Ki loi machshevoisai machshevoiseichem v'goymer, your thoughts are not my thoughts. Most people interpret that to mean Hashem has plans and we have other plans and we don't understand God's plans. That's true. There's plenty about what Hashem does that we don't begin to understand. But that's not what this verse is saying. This verse isn't just saying Hashem knows stuff that we don't know or Hashem has a, percept a perspective that we don't have. We're saying His thoughts are not what you and I would identify as thought. It's a completely different software. It operates in a way that is so radically different to anything we've ever experienced. We wouldn't know it if we stared at it in the face. Now, all of that is by way of introduction to what we're really going to learn about the soul. Because right now, we don't really have a handle on what this is. We just know that there's a principle, that the soul originates in God's intellect, which implies that there's a very deep, intimate connection between my soul and Hashem. Now, immediately, before we get into the details of exactly how this works, immediately, there is a question that we have to ask ourselves. If this is true. If the definition of the nefesh elikis, the special divine soul, that makes me Jewish. If that soul originates in Hashem's absolute divine essence, a.k.a. God's divine intellect, then that would seem to imply that we're all exactly the same. Because, yes, externally, this person's taller, shorter, more attractive, less attractive, speaks clearly, doesn't speak clearly, popular, unpopular, or whatever, ultimately, surely, we're all the same. Now, if you look around, it really doesn't look that way. And that's going to be a big question about the notion of a soul. And the big question about the notion of a soul that is directly connected to God. If it's true, how come we all look so diverse? 
It's that question, which the Alter Rebbe will pose now, that will take us to really understand what the soul is. You know, that's the methodology of how we learn in Judaism. I had an interesting conversation earlier this week with a group of high school students. And the question I posed to them is, you know, everybody knows Pesach is coming, and on Pesach we ask the questions. So is Pesach the one time of a year that we're supposed to ask questions? Or is Pesach representative of what Judaism is all about, which is asking questions? And of course, thank God, they all had a good education. And they all put up their hands and they said, no, Judaism is very much about asking questions, which is correct. And it only leads us, of course, to a question. <laughs> right? The question is, why? Why does Judaism want us to ask so many questions? And it was interesting, it was very interesting to hear their responses. Because, for example, they said, Judaism wants us to ask questions because it's that important to understand things. If you don't really understand a concept, then it doesn't resonate with you, and then you can't really apply yourself to the concept. So you have to ask the questions and ask the questions until you understand, which is valid. But it's deeper than that. Judaism asks questions and encourages us to ask questions. As the verse says, Moshe says to the Jewish people before his passing, Ask your parents. Ask your elders. Or as it says with regards to the Pesach Seder, One day your child's going to have questions and you'd better be prepared to answer them. In other words, Judaism encourages the idea of questions and anybody who's familiar with the Gemara will know that it's more questions than answers. Almost as if to say there's a value in a question that an answer doesn't have. An answer is the end of a line very often. Once a person is satisfied that they've heard the answer to a question, that's often where they stop sharing and, and checking and looking and investigating. So questions sometimes are more important than answers. And that's why in Judaism you'll notice that the style of Torah learning is we don't just share facts. We share a concept, and then we ask a hard-hitting question about the concept. And the value of that is that once you have a hard-hitting question about the, the, the topic, it forces you to question whether or not you've understood the topic. So here we've made this sweeping statement, and it's really beautiful and inspiring to say that my neshama and your neshama and the next person's neshama all originate in the deepest part of God. So now let's ask a hard-hitting question. If that is so true, how come Jews are so different spiritually? If we all share the same kind of neshama, we're all running on the same network, why are we so different? And it's in that question that we'll begin to understand what a neshama truly is. And more importantly, possibly, what our experience of accessing that neshama should be like. So this is how he poses the question. In spite of the fact that there are myriads different levels of souls, Govoya Mial Govoya Lein Kates, where one level of soul is superior or higher than the next level of soul, Ad Ein Kates, literally to a point that you can you can't even count. There are so many different souls. You can't even distinguish between this level and the next. It's just, it's so diverse. Kimoi, he's going to give us three examples. Example number one. Kimoi, goidel malas nishmas ha'avois umoysha abeinu alei ma'sholem. Al nishmas teriseinu eile dik for meshicha. Shem b'chinas ha'gvayim mamish legabe ha'moyach v'horosh. First example. Try and compare the caliber of soul of our forefathers, of our patriarchs, of our matriarchs, of Moshe Rabbeinu is called Rabban Shakol Nevi'im, the ultimate prophet. Try to compare those neshamas to our souls in the modern world in a period of time that is called Ikvaser de Mashiach, literally the footsteps of Mashiach, the heels of Mashiach. And look what he says. Shem b'chinas ha'gvayim mamesh legabei ha'moyach v'horosh. It's trying to compare the heel of the body to the brain of the body. What does that mean? So one of the interesting things that we're taught is that the entire Jewish people over the course of history is compared to what's called koima achas shleimo. So if you had to take a human anatomy and examine the different parts of the human anatomy, so you could say that over the course of history, the whole Jewish people, if you took all of our souls and put it together, 
that would create a spiritual equivalent of the human anatomy. So we're often taught that Adam, Adam Harisha, in the original human, contained and comprised within his soul all of our souls. So that's a beautiful idea, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. And the idea is that all of our souls together behave in a networked interaction that is similar to the human body. So let's think for a moment about the human body. What's the difference between the brain and the heel? I would hope that we don't have to think too hard about this. <laughs> I would hope that it's pretty obvious straight away what the differences are between the heel and the brain. But let's examine one or two as an example. First of all, there are many, many people in many circumstances who walk around barefoot. You can go down to the beach and you can walk, bare, walk barefoot in the sand. You could choose to walk barefoot in your own garden. You know, some people tell you there's many health benefits and it grounds you and it's all kind of good stuff. You could walk barefoot in mud. And that's actually the example that let's focus on for a second. Your heel does not protest being in the mud. <laughs> Right? It takes it, whatever. You know, this is what you got to do. This is what you got to do. You go schlep around in the mud barefoot. The heel will handle it. Takes it on the nose. And what happens at the end? You come back to wherever it is that you are. You wash off your feet and that's it. Finished. It's over. No harm done. You had a good time. You slushed around in the mud. You feel good. And it's done. Now what would happen, God forbid, if a person was in the middle of brain surgery and a tiny microscopic speck of dirt got into the open head. You understand the difference? I mean, you can't compare. The brain is so sensitized. The brain is so powerful that the tiniest little bit of something which is unhealthy that gets into the brain could have devastating effects. So here the heel can slip around in the mud for days on end, no problem. The brain is so sensitive that the tiniest drop of dust gets into the brain, God forbid, and you have a crisis of epic proportions. Well, here's another example. The heel, the Gemara calls the heel, the Malach HaMoves Sheba Adam, the angel of death in the human being. Why? Because everybody knows your heel is very insensitive. You know, you often get like hard and calloused skin on a person's heel. It's completely insensitive. How much life is inside a person's heel? If you had to go and scrape away that calloused skin from the heel, will you survive? Of course you survive. In fact, you'll be relieved. Compare that to the brain. The brain is the epicenter of the entire system. If anything isn't functioning as it should in the brain, there's a whole section of the human system that could stop functioning. So to compare the brain and the heel is to compare two things that are on the opposite extreme of the spectrum. So us, we, in spiritual terms, we the generation called Ikvasa de Mashiach, the people who are standing at the heels of Mashiach, on the brink of the messianic arrival, what kind of spiritual people are we? Like a heel. <laughs> it's very complimentary, of course, you know, because we all believe that we're the bee's knees. And we think we're big deals. And we think that we're all so spiritual because I did a course in spirituality. And I downloaded an ebook, and it told me how to meditate. So now I think that I'm somebody amazing. And not only that, I even took a picture with some guru in India. So that's it. I'm really a mystic. The reality is that we are a generation that not, be, not due to any fault of our own, we are so spiritually desensitized that we are in the Koima Shlema, in this historic human anatomy of Jewish souls, we're all the way at the bottom in the most insensitive part of the whole thing. Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rochel, Leah, Moshe, Rabbeinu, these people, their experience of being spiritual, their experience of God, their experience of connection is so sensitized and so dynamic and so encompassing that just like the brain has an impact on the entire operating system of the whole body, their stories have a direct impact on the spiritual operation of all of us. So now, are you telling me that Moshe Rabbeinu, who the Torah says, ponim el ponim diber Hashem, that Hashem spoke to him face to face, 
Are you telling me that Avraham Avinu, our forefather Avraham, who in spite of the fact that he grew up in a pagan environment where everybody wanted to get rid of him, was able to recognize God and then go and teach that to the entire world. Yitzchak Avinu, who was willing to sacrifice his life for Hashem without question. Are you telling, are you telling me that they, their neshama is the same as my neshama? How is that possible? How is their neshama and my neshama the same thing if our experience of life is so radically different? That's example one. How can you tell me that the brain and the heel are the same? <laughs> They're so far from the same. Example number two. That was an, an examination of the entire spectrum of Jewish history. That if I compare the top of Jewish history to the bottom of Jewish history, I will see that there is this gaping chasm. There's a black hole of difference between the two types of Jew, Moshe and us. But the truth is, even if I look within a single, a single generation, which is maybe a little bit more fair, comparing apples with apples, when I look at people who live in our time, what, are we all spiritually homogenous? The same is within every single generation. Yes, Roshe Alpha Yisrael. Within every single generation, there are those unique individuals who are called the heads of thousands of other Jews. If you had to compare those individuals and their souls to the rest of their generation, they are the brain's trust of their generation. They are the spiritual epicenter of their generation. How can you compare them to the average person of the same time period? So something doesn't add up over here. We make this beautiful comment about how all of us have this incredible neshama and it's a gift from Hashem and it's it's your slice of godliness that lives inside of you and it originates in the highest levels of divine wisdom which is actually the highest level of divine essence. And then practically, one of these people lives in one part of the Jewish world totally aligned with everything that Hashem wants and another person lives on the same block as them and has no spiritual connection whatsoever you're going to tell me that these are both called a, a piece of God you're going to tell me that both of these neshamas are plugged into the mainframe how does it work? It doesn't seem to make any sense. The truth be told, I don't even have to look so far afield. I don't even have to look at generation versus generation or leaders versus plebs. I can just look at every single soul. Because once we start to examine and understand what a soul is, we get to appreciate that Every one of our souls is multi-layered. Krulomi nefesh, ruach, uneshama. During the course of Tanya, we'll actually get a better handle on what these different levels of soul are. For now, let's just simply say nefesh is the lowest dimension of the soul. And ruach is a very developed, mature part of the soul, which is associated with our ability to have mature feelings towards God and neshama is the level that allows us an intellectual appreciation of God so that's very different my nefesh dimension of my soul is just enough spiritual power to get me to do what a Jewish person should do and my neshama dimension of the soul allows me access to understand things that the human brain should be un unable to understand so how's that all the same soul and, and, and right now we're about to learn this, this is teeing us up for such an important principle such an important principle that the same value does not mean you have to be a clone of the next person the fact that my neshama is as valuable in God's eyes as the neshama of Moshe Rabbeinu is not synonymous with saying I am Moshe Rabbeinu Moshe was a great individual, the greatest to ever live. And so his experience of his soul was completely different to my experience of my soul. It's a beautiful story. 
I think it was in the uh, in late 50s or the early 60s, and there was a group of students who had a wonderful opportunity to come and spend a private audience together with the Rebbe. And they had questions, various questions that they wanted to ask. And one of the questions that they asked was, it was you know, open mic so they could, they could be very direct. So one of the questions that they asked was, is it true that a Rebbe can perform miracles? And what is a Rebbe? What is a Rebbe and is it true that a Rebbe can perform miracles? And the Rebbe essentially explained to them that all of us have the same neshama, but we don't all have the same experience of that neshama. And what makes a Rebbe unique is the extent to which a Rebbe experiences his neshama. And what makes us perhaps less so is that we don't experience our neshama to the fullest extent or even to a fraction of its abilities. And then he went on to tell them that uh, miracles, anybody can make a miracle and you should make a miracle yourselves. And he said, the miracle that you will perform is you'll start to put on tefillin from tomorrow. <laughs> so that was, uh, you know, that was basically a message that a miracle essentially means stepping outside of everything that you believe to be your reality. But that's subject for another conversation. So there's diversity. There's diversity in souls. And the moment, the moment people see diversity, they think diversity means different values. That's a more valuable soul, and that's a less valuable soul. And it's quite unfortunate that the Alter Rebbe was, lived through a time where a lot of the Jewish world, particularly in the Ashkenazi world, believed this. They believed in some kind of a spiritual caste system where there were those who were intellectual and those who were more knowledgeable were held in higher esteem and there were those who unfortunately for whatever reason were less educated or less capable of being educated and they were held as less valuable as Jews and it even reached a point where there was the discrimination of different shuls so there were certain shuls that were reserved for the simple folk and there were other shuls that, you know, in order to be able to belong to those shuls, you had to have a certain qualification, you had to have mastered a certain amount of Talmudic knowledge, and so on and so forth. And one of the cutting differences of the Hasidic movement, particularly uh, as explained in, in Chabad Hasidus, but introduced by the Baal Shem Tov, is this leveling of the playing field. That you have to understand that even though people express on the outside different degrees of soul, fundamentally they all have the same value of soul and that's what he's going to tell us now Mikol Mokim, second paragraph Mikol Mokim, nonetheless Shoresh Kol HaNefesh Ruach Neshama Kulam the root of every single dimension of every single soul Meroish Kol HaMadregois from the highest or the head of all levels Ad Soif Kol Dargin until the end or the lowest of all levels where would you find the lowest of all levels? That's the kind of soul that you would discover living inside the body of somebody who is an Am Ha'aretz. <laughs> What's an Am Ha'aretz? Most people will translate it as an ignoramus, which is accurate. So much so, in fact, well, listen, when you see what the Talmud defines as an ignoramus, you might catch a fright. Because for us, we think, oh, what's an ignoramus? You know, a person doesn't even know what Pesach is. No, no, no. If you have a look what the Talmud describes as an ignoramus, it's pretty much all of us. But there's another translation. Am Ha'aretz means the nation of the earth. People who are very materialistic. They, they relate very much to tangible physical things, and they don't relate to spiritual things. And therefore, that goes hand in hand with the concept of Kal Shebekalim. Kal Shebekalim means somebody of no real spiritual weight. They don't really express a meaningful spiritual persona. You'll also notice, by the way, the Alter Rebbe, in his cho choice of language, everything is particularly precise. Even to the point that he agonized at times for weeks over the exact nuance of what, which letter to use where. So you'll notice over here, if you're familiar, he says, Meroish kol hamadregois, that's Hebrew. At Soif called Dargin, that's Aramaic. When he talks about the highest levels, the fact that there are Jews who are at this incredibly advanced spiritual level, he refers to them in the holy tongue, Lashon HaKodesh, holy language, because we're talking about people who are at a holy level. But when he talks about somebody who's lowly and somebody who's disconnected from the reality of their own soul, then he speaks in Aramaic. Aramaic was a colloquial language. Aramaic was a language of people who lived outside of Israel after the Jews had been exiled. Aramaic is a language of the streets. 
So it's very carefully chosen over here to tell us that that's the range. The range of the Jewish experience is from somebody who lives 24-7 in holiness to the person who pretty much lives as a man of the street. And maybe on occasion we can remind him or her that there's a spark of soul inside of you. So what does he tell us? Shoresh, the root of every single soul. Nimshach mi moyach ha'elien shihi chokma ilok vayochol. It originates from this supernal wisdom, which is what we call, or the supernal brain, which is what we call God's wisdom. So now we've kind of rounded off this idea that when we talk about Allah b'machshava, that the Jewish soul originated very deep in God's thought process as a catalyst for the entire process that would eventually lead to creation, we're saying that's the root. When you encounter a tree, for example, you don't see the root. In fact, you may, if you don't know much about botany, you may believe that there is no root. You may believe that the tree starts from where you can see it. That's why people are sometimes surprised by what a tree can do. It starts to uproot parts of the house, or it starts to suck out all the water that's in a particular area. You don't realize, because you don't see the roots, you don't understand what they're capable of doing. A person thinks they're just going to chop down a tree and it will be the end of their problems. They don't realize how much work it is to get all those roots out so that the tree is actually gone. Shoresh kol nefesh what we see of the soul in our own experience is nothing. We certainly don't see the root. And the root of the soul is rooted in God. Now at this point in time, of course, you probably have a picture in your mind and the picture is probably of a tree with a root system. Now, if you take that picture and you flip it, you'll have a better idea of how it looks in spiritual terms. Because in physical terms, the root system is always beneath the ground and it's lower than the tree. And in spiritual systems, the root system is higher and is above the person's conscious reality. So the roots we're talking about are up there at a level beyond what we can see, at a frequency that our eyes are unable to perceive. But one thing is for sure, the root of every single neshama is rooted in God. That still hasn't asked, uh, answered our question. Our question was, if we all are rooted in God, why do we all appear so different? Now there's an expression that the sages use, they say, When a smart person asks a question, the question in itself is already half of the answer. So how did we ask the question? How did the Alter Rebbe ask the question? He said, how do you compare the souls of people like Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rocholeah, Moshe, and so on, who are called the brain of the Jewish people, how do you compare them to us, where we are called the heel of the Jewish people? And that was a massive clue that he gave us. A massive clue. And that clue is what he will develop through the metaphor of why it is that Hashem said we are His children. Hashem doesn't say we are His children just because He wants to show us how much He loves us and that there's a closeness between us. And you know how it is with a parent and a child. Very often you feel like you want to rip your child's hair out and other times you just you love your child absolutely despite everything that they have done. And that's the dominant feature. Yes, you have the times where you lose your rag, but that's not the reality. The reality is when you connect and the reality is when you feel that love, that beautiful connection to your child. And that's what we want to say between us and God that God will always love us and no matter how many times we let him down and no matter how many times we turn our back and no matter how many times we say I don't like you you're not my father he'll still take us in that's usually how people understand the notion of the metaphor of us being God's children but we're about to discover something altogether different how it's a far more profound metaphor and quite honestly, I think that we are privileged to live in the modern world to be able to understand this metaphor possibly in a way that previous generations, although they had access to the metaphor, were not able to understand. So this metaphor of a child is incredibly powerful. This notion of all of our souls, despite our external differences, all root back to a direct connection to God, that is best explained with a metaphor of a child. 
the child, as we already described earlier in this chapter, the child originates in the father's brain. Now, it's a fascinating concept and maybe very divorced from how we understand the process of conception. Nobody imagines that that's an intellectual process. Conception is an instinctive process. The way God designed all kinds of living things is that in order to perpetuate their species, they will be attracted to members of the opposite gender in order to be able to, to, to propagate. There's no brain, there's no intellect, except in the human experience. Because in the human experience, there very much is an intellect. There's a choice, firstly, where a person could choose not to have children. And definitely there's a choice as to who the person will uh, bear children with. So it starts in the brain. But we're going to take that much deeper and understand this much deeper than what appears at first brush. So let's read this paragraph. We'll do one layer of explanation now. And please God, next time we'll come to understand it even more deeply. It's like the parable of a child who develops from the father's brain. Where even the toenails of this baby will develop from that original seed that the father implanted in the mother. Now, you have to ask yourself a question. One second. One moment you're telling me that the child originates from the father's brain, and the next moment you're telling me that the, father, that the child originates from the father's seed. Now that doesn't really sound the same, so how exactly are we to understand this? So you go and you look in Talmudic literature, and the way it describes it sounds very weird, almost like, you know, unrelatable to us. But this is pretty much how it's explained in Talmudic and mystical sources. Thoughts become sensations. So, in other words, the whole neuro system that a human being has is all about feedback that goes back and forth between pieces, parts of the body and the brain, and the brain in those parts of the body. So the brain will stimulate a part of the body to react in a particular way. Your eyes to blink, your heart to pump, your mouth to move so that you can talk, your hands to gesticulate or to reach and get things. It's all impulses coming from the brain. Now, if you think about it, what happens every single time that there is an impulse from the brain, we don't feel the brain impulse. We feel the physical result of that impulse. So, for example, if a person takes their hand and moves it up and down, that's a physical sensation that you're aware of. Your hand has moved up and down. You're completely oblivious to the fact that there was a whole neurological process that caused, in a nanosecond, that caused that to happen. So because it's so fast and because it's so subtle, we don't even know that it's happened. And that's why until a person learns and understands a little bit about how the neurological system works, we don't even know that there is such an impulse. So a child, for example, doesn't think that there's something going on in your brain and then your hand moves. They see your hand move. That's all they know. So we have to learn this information. We have to learn to identify that non-physical impulses that start in the brain become physical impulses actions, movements, and sensations that happen in the body. So when you touch something, you put your hand down and you touch something, it's not that your fingers feel the texture of what you're touching. It's that your fingers send a lightning message to your brain that then interprets and sends back a sensation and tells you that that's what you're feeling. So what your brain does is it translates these electrical neurological impulses into physical experiences, physical movement, physical sensation. But it's more than that. Because let's say for argument's sake that a person was in a situation where they felt very afraid. So then not only will the brain turn your impulses into the fight and flight impulses that you might have, which are physical sensations, but your, your brain will now get your body to start producing certain chemicals that previously it wasn't producing or at least not in that measure so it will get your body to start producing adrenaline the, the physical adrenaline that starts coursing through your veins through your body that adrenaline started off as a neurological impulse and the perspiration on the palms of your hand as you get nervous that physical perspiration began as a sensation in your brain began as a neurological process
And by the same token, now that you put it into those terms, you can go back and read what our sages say, and it doesn't sound so quirky anymore. So our sages say that the impulse in the brain to want to have a child goes down the spinal cord as a sensation that then translates into the physical production of seed that becomes the conception of that child. Fascinating that all of those generations ago, our rabbis spoke the language of modern science. So therefore, where does the child come from? Moyach ha'av, from the brain of the father. A child is not just some kind of biological material that was deposited and then fertilized and then developed into a child. It begins as a sensation of the mind, of the brain. And that brain catalyst will eventually result in that child's toenails. And that's fascinating. And that's what we have to explore further to really understand the power of this metaphor. One of the most incredible metaphors that we will ever learn about the soul or even generally speaking about any spiritual concept. And that's, please God, what we'll pick up in greater detail next time.